Okay, everyone, let's go ahead and get started. Why don't we stand together? <clears throat> Dedicate our time to, to our God. <clears throat> Excuse me. Father, we come before you, your, your people, your family, and we ask, Lord, that you would... Uh, dedicate this time, that you would make it a holy place and a holy time. We thank you, Lord, that you promised to be here with us, to inhabit our, the praises of your people and to guide us into truth. So we want to dedicate ourselves to that only tonight, Father. It's, it's good to fellowship. <clears throat> it's good to be together in your house, but we want <clears throat> to give our focus to you and you alone. <clears throat> to God be the glory. Amen. To God be the glory, great things he has done, and great our rejoice to Jesus the Son who yielded his life and atonement for sin and open the life gate that all may go in perfect redemption the purchase of blood to every believer the promise of God the vilest offender who truly Jesus, a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus, the Son, and give him the glory. Great has done great things he has taught us great things he has done and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son a pure and higher and greater will be our wonder our transport when Jesus received Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory. Great things he has done. Say hi to someone. His soul, 
sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. His holy name Sing like never before Oh my soul I'll worship your holy name You're rich in love And you're slow to I will keep on singing Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find Bless the Lord, oh my soul Oh my soul Worship His holy name Sing like never strength is failing the end draws near and my time has come still my soul will sing your praise unending ten thousand years and then forever more bless the Lord oh my soul Worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. Bless the Lord, oh, my soul. Oh, my soul. Worship His holy name. I worship your holy name. Father, we thank you for our time of praise and adoration, Lord. Thank you for your Holy Spirit, God. 
Father, we ask that you would teach us things that only you can teach us, Lord. We pray that you would make the word of God alive, Lord. We pray that you'd work in each one of our hearts, give us understanding and knowledge, Lord God. Make us wise as serpents, but gentle as doves, Lord God. Bless our time together as we study, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen. Please be seated. Our study tonight is in Proverbs chapter 2, so if you have your Bibles, turn with me through Proverbs chapter 2. In a lot of the book of Proverbs, you're going to learn wisdom. I wish I was a Christian when I was young in the sense of growing up. I wish I learned so much about the Bible, especially in the book of Proverbs, how to deal with life, how to keep myself from different things or different people. I didn't. I wasn't a Christian. But if I would have, I would have been kept from so many sorrows and so much pain. We all have been there, haven't we? The book of Solomon, uh, the book of Proverbs, teaches us wisdom on how to deal with all kinds of things in life. I like what people have described this thing called wisdom as. Let me give you a couple of instances or examples. J.J. Packer says, wisdom is the power to see and the inclination to choose the best and the highest goal together with the surest means of attaining it. Doug Larson says it this way, wisdom is a reward you get for a lifetime of listening when you have preferred you would have preferred to talk. That's a good one, isn't it? Automaker Henry Ford asked electrician genius Charles Steinmetz to build a generator for his factory. One day the generators ground to to a halt and repairmen couldn't find the problem. So Ford called Semmes, who tinkered with the machine for a few hours and then threw the switch. The generator swirled to life, but Ford got a bill for $10,000 from Snizemus, flabbergasted, the rather tight-fisted car maker inquired why the bill was so high. Smith's Steinmetz said, we're tinkering with the generator $10 for knowing where to tinkle, tinker, $9,990. Ford paid the bill. So we're going to talk about wisdom in chapter 2. And hopefully we'll get to chapter 3 tonight. But we're going to move slow because I think it's so important. Verse 1 says, My son, if you receive my words and you treasure my commands within you. So the first thing we want to know is that Solomon is a writer. The Bible teaches he was the wisest man. God gave him wisdom because he asked God for wisdom. And with all that wisdom that he has, he begins to speak to his children and he begins to speak to his, speak to his son. Solomon's first son was named Rehoboam. He became king after him. Many believe that he's speaking to Rehoboam right here. And so he's handing down wisdom to his son that he loves. And the first thing he mentions here is, my son, to receive my words. I don't know if you've noticed it lately with some young people, not all. Most young people do not receive the word of God very well. They don't receive instruction very well. But I believe that can be in every single nature. It doesn't have to be an older person. It doesn't have to be a younger person. It can be any age person that is not willing to learn or to accept whether it be some kind of teaching or some kind of correction. The Bible teaches us that we are to be good listeners, good hearers, and good obeyers. 
Solomon here speaks about the importance of the willingness to be taught. The older you get, the closer you get to God, and this is a spiritual truth, if you're really honest with God, you recognize that you don't know much about God. Just when I think I know and I got something down pat, and it's true what I know, and it's fact, and it's solid, but many times I recognize that I only know the skin's surface of it. I thought I really knew it a deep, it's deeper than I knew it before. But the more you realize when you're in the presence of God, of what you've learned, the more you realize that you do not know. It's easy to become settled and God wants you to be settled. God wants you to have a strong foundation so when the winds of storms come in life, you're set in stone. God wants that for you without a doubt. But God wants you to go deeper and you have to be able to learn and be teachable and you have to be teachable from anyone. Rhea Rome probably looked at his dad and said, no, dad, you're always saying these kind of things to me. What else do you want me to know now? That's probably what he said. I was probably just going, hmm. He was going over his head with some of it. And that can happen to us as Christians. We must listen and even hear. But if you don't want to learn, if you are not willing to be taught, you will stay among the foolish. And that's a fact. We must be teachable. We are to never stop learning concerning God and his principles. These are what can change our character. Every single day I read the book of Proverbs, I bring it, read it to my wife. We spend time together, we're very blessed to be able to spend time, read our devotionals, read our Bible together. But I read Proverbs to her every single day. And every day I read the book of Proverbs or the chapter that I'm in. Today is chapter 18, because it's the 18th. As I read Proverbs, although I've read it for at least 30 years, God shows me new stuff and reminds me of old stuff that I have maybe forgotten or is less important. It changes how I think and it works in my character. The church, the body of Christ, those born again should be the most successful people whether it be in their marriage whether they be with their children whether it be in their workplace and I'm not talking about success in the sense of prosperity although that can be added to it because there are a lot of good Christian men and women who love God and walk with God who God has blessed and prospered But the greatest blessing are good children. The greatest blessing are good grandchildren. The greatest blessing are good husbands and good wives, where life is good. My wife and I, we say this to each other, we have been blessed, and I know you've heard me say this before, but I can't stop saying it. We've been a Christian for 45, 45? 50 years. How many? Since 76. Since 76. So we've been a few weeks. My point is, our life has been blessed by God. And it isn't because we are any special privileged people. It's that we've tried to live the Word of God by the Spirit of God. We've listened to what the Bible says and applied it to whether it be our children, our grandchildren, our marriage, our business, we don't have business, or whatever. It may be. 
The word of God, when it's learned and it's applied, it produces fruit that God desires for you in your life. It produces character. But we must be teachable. And sometimes it's not easy to embrace. Sometimes it's like embracing a cactus. That's how it is sometimes. It really rubs you raw. You have to swallow your pride at times. So Solomon goes on, my son, if you receive my words, and that could be literally God's word, what Solomon is bringing forth, his commands. And then he says, if you will treasure them, store them up, hide them in your heart. And he uses that word for a reason. Treasure is something that we value. We need to handle God's word the same way as a, a treasure. There are many jewels in there that will make life so rich. Listen to this illustration. A man was out walking in the desert when a voice said to him, pick up some pebbles and put them in your pocket and tomorrow you will be both sorry and glad. The man obeyed. He stooped down and he picked up a handful of pebbles and he put them in his pocket. The next morning he reached into his pocket and he found diamonds and rubies and emeralds. As he was both glad and sorry, Glad that he had taken some. Sorry he hadn't taken more. And so it is with God's word. God's word is a treasure. Take all that you can get in every area of your life, not just for the moment. Yes, take what you need for the moment, but also take for what you're going to need for the future. And literally it says here that treasure his commands within you. And he's talking partly about the Ten Commandments, but he's talking about all the commands of God. Why did God give us the commandments? Now, we know that we live in the New Testament, and the Ten Commandments is the Old Testament, but those are still fulfilled in the two commandments that God gives us which is to love God with all your heart, the first four commandments in the Old Testament, and to love your neighbor as yourself, which is the last six commandments in the Old Testament. So why did God give that to us? Why do we need commands? Why don't we just live our life the way we want to live? You know, we're pretty smart. We're grown up. We should be able to make good choices. I have found it to be true. I am not a good, good choice maker on my own. I need the Spirit of God and the Word of God to guide and lead me more than ever, especially in the days that we live. I need those commands because God knows I need them. And they protect me from me and the old man and the old nature, that sinful nature, that selfish nature. So God gave commands, and Solomon gives his son and reminds him to keep his commands, what I've told you, because they will, as we will see, do certain things. So, verse 2, that you incline your ear to wisdom, and you apply your heart to understanding. So, the word literally incline means in the Hebrew, to be attentive, to heed, to hearken, to pay attention, to listen. And apply your heart to understanding. To stretch out, to spread out. To hold on to, to extend. 
So we must accordingly receive the word of God with all readiness of mind and bid it welcome even the commandments as well as the promises without murmuring or disputing. Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. I love to hear about the love of God. And I know how much God loves me. I studied on the love of God probably more than any area of life in the, in the Christian Bible about the love of God. It wasn't because I wanted to be selfish, it's because I needed to for myself. It taught me how much God loved me and how God was in control. And everything that God allows to happen in my life is his perfect will as I yield and surrender myself over to him. I've learned that God's love cancels out fear, and I believe that's the only antidote for fear is the love of God in Christ Jesus. And I can receive that on anyone who wants to talk about the love of God, I can accept that. But there are times in the Word of God where God will speak a word to me that it makes me sorrowful inside. And you might say this, this, this evening that, well, that's not from God. God never want to make you to be sorrowful. The Bible says different. Matter of fact, it says sorrow brings more repentance than laughter. I'm not saying laughter is bad. That's not, what I, that's not what I'm saying. Receiving God's word means receiving whatever God has for us, whatever God says, accepting it as from God himself. I would never say anything to my grandchildren or my children that would hurt them on purpose. And that doesn't mean I would never say the truth that would help them and protect them and change them. So Solomon speaks to his son about this, apply your heart to understanding. And that speaks not about the outside, it speaks about the inward man. It speaks about the will, the mind, And then it speaks about what he's to apply his heart to, understanding. This word literally means insight that God gives. Every one of you as a Christian, God has spoken to you some understanding of some area in your life or scripture that you need insight in. And you have applied that to your life and you've seen the benefit of it, or you haven't applied it to your life, and you see the destruction of not applying it. This word also means to get or receive, talking about understanding, the meaning of, or to know, or grasp the right perception concerning the truth. We, as Christians, must side these with us as we do our treasure, which we are afraid of being robbed of. We must not only receive, but retain the word of God and lodge it in our hearts that it may always be ready to use. Now, Raise your hand if you have a safe in your house. Nobody? Okay. I, Dan does. I do have a safe in my house. A safe. You know, a safe where you put your guns in or you put your money in. Or you, I have a safe. Not much in there, but I have a safe. And I put those things in there that I th hold precious to me because they're treasures to me. 
Some of them, those things are things I got when I was real young. Uh, they're baseball cards, some of them. They're, they're different things that I have, I put in there. I have some old coins, a few old silver coins. I put them there because I treasure them. I don't want them to be taken. And God wants us to treasure the Word of God. It's the most valuable thing that you'll ever have. Stop for a moment and think about this. Look at our young generation right now. Look and see what they treasure. Most of them are in that place because they have never been taught the Word of God, the truth. And because of that, they believe a lie and accept a lie. And that's what rules and reigns in their lives. That's what they treasure. Green, the house, I mean the, the earth. They worship the earth now. That's more important than anything else. And they'll put their lives out there, wear their masks, and defend what they're doing and do whatever they need to do to stop what they believe in life or have been taught to believe that is contrary to really what God says is true. They don't have the truth. Now, verse 3 goes on. Solomon is still speaking. Yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift your voice for understanding. So literally, he says, cry out. In other words, pray like you've never prayed before. In other words, weep before God and say, God, I got to have answers. I got to have your counsel. This word discernment literally means to separate a thing mentally from another or others. In other words, to be able to separate from right from what is wrong, what is true and what is not true, what is good and what is evil. The Bible teaches about three men or four men that we know well, Daniel, Shadrach, Abednego, Meshach, who went to God and cried out all night. And the reason why they went that, they did that is because King Nebuchadnezzar was going to have their heads by the morning if they didn't have the dream and the interpretation of the dream. So imagine this. You're one of these men. And by the morning, you better have that answer of the dream and the interpretation. If not, slicing and dicing, your head comes off. So how fervent do you think you will pray if that's you praying? I have no doubt that everyone you in this room would have be crying before God. And I guarantee you wouldn't be sleeping. There would not be one of you fall asleep, I don't believe because your life is on the line. There are many spiritual truths that the Bible says our spiritual lives are on the line. It's not that you're gonna lose your salvation. That's not what I'm talking about. But my, you might lose your relationship with God, the closeness. Your children, your grandchildren may lose that same relationship. And so when there are needs, when you need discernment, you need to be able to divide things rightly you need to get on your knees and be serious about God in the sense of God please reveal to me what you want me to do this is exactly what Solomon is saying to his son and his sons and this is what God is saying to us when you lift up your voice for understanding praying to God for discernment, for insight, for answers. If you, verse 4, seek her as silver, and you search for her as a hidden treasure. During the gold rush in California, 
during the silver rush in Canada, then traveled from New York to California, sacrificing their lives even, their families, leaving their families behind, hoping that they would find gold, hoping in Canada they would find silver. Very few people did find gold and silver. Yes, it was a big gold rush. Yes, it was a big silver rush. But most of the people who went there literally gave up their lives and died, majority of them. They starved to death, froze to death, but they were willing to do that so they could find this treasure we call gold and silver to become rich. And the Bible teaches literally here that this is how we are to search for God in the sense of his word. In the days that we live, the most valuable thing you're going to have is not the dollar. It is not going to be the gold that's in your safe. It's not going to be any of those things. When I begin to see what's happening in the world today, the Bible describes what's going to happen in our world today. Second Timothy speaks of what our world's going to be like. Matthew speaks about what our world is going to be like. Daniel speaks about what our world is going to be like. And so when I see things unfold, those are my treasure. I understand what God says is happening, and it makes me see the faithfulness of God to the Word of God. And so what's going to keep me when these times are getting hard and we see things happening, when we see the economy begin to collapse and we see... The one world government began to move into place. We began to see all these things. What is going to keep me? Is a treasure that I have concerning the word of God. That's so important. And you search for her as hidden treasure. Again, it's painful at times. When you're searching for God and for the word of God, God will be found, but it's painful. It's painful to the old nature. It's putting down the old man and saying no to the old man. Uh, Let me explain and let me remind, remind some of you. Digging is not easy. I put a French drain in my house again. This is the third French drain I put in. And so digging in mud is not easy. It's heavy. It's hard work. The reward is the water drains. (laughs) That's how it works. But digging is hard work. Digging into God's word many times can be painful to us. If you think all of a sudden, and there are times that it does happen, that you open up the Word of God and you say, oh, that's awesome. I like that. That's, man, I'm keeping that one. That's a promise I'm keeping. And that's wonderful because God does that many times. But if you really want to know God and know the depths of God's Word, and you want these treasures, these rubies, these gold deep within your heart, you have to dig. You have to do some work. And you have to prepare your heart for it. He goes on in verse 5. When you've done this, and you treasure these things up, then you will understand the fear of the Lord, and you will find knowledge of God. So when you have done this, you'll find the fear of the Lord. And we talked about that last week. So I want to just touch on it just for a second. That is, thou shalt know how to worship him, 
our right, shall be led into the mean and the mystery of every ordinance and be enabled to answer the end of its practice. If you are truly searching after true knowledge, what you'll find after you've searched, you'll have jewels, gold, but let me tell you who you'll find. You'll find God. Verse 6 says, For the Lord gives wisdom, and from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright, and he is a shield to those who walk uprightly. So it says here, he stores up our treasures, sound wisdom. This is a different wisdom than what we've been talking about somewhat. It is a sound or efficient wisdom abiding success. This is another word for wisdom that can also mean abiding success or victory. It means also soundness, our health and safety. But notice who he says he stores up this wisdom for. He says for the upright. That is for, in the Hebrew, Greek, or the Hebrew word, it means straight, or correct, or right. That which is righteous, or those who are righteous. Those who are honest, or honorable, unbending moral straightness, integrity. So this is who God stores up this kind of wisdom for, safety and um, success and and all, every Christian can be part of this, be in this. It's God's desire. But the Bible teaches that God wants us to have integrity. And there's not a lot of integrity out there today, even in the church. I like to describe integ integrity as right and upright, just like it says in the Hebrews. But the thing is, is this. Integrity is being who God says you're to be and thinking and acting what God says you're to think and act. Being honest in your words, in your speech. God wants us to have integrity. It says he is a shield to those who walk uprightly. A shield is for protection or for safety. But even those who walk uprightly may be brought into danger for the trial of their faith. But God is and will be a buckler to them so that nothing that happens to them shall do them any hurt or possess them with a terrific apprehensions. They are saved and they shall think themselves so. He goes on and speaks to those who walk uprightly, those who live their life uprightly with integrity. Verse 8 says, He guards, talking about God, the path of justice, and he preserves the way of his saints. So God defends, he says he regards the path, so God defends the right way and those on it. He guards them from danger. And he preserves the way of his saints. Interesting word, a little bit different than the New Testament the Greek, but the Hebrew is 
objects of uh, objects of favor. That's what saints were. And he preserves his saints, guards them as a watchman does. Then he says this in verse 9, Then you will understand righteousness, justice, uh, equity, and every good path. So you will understand righteousness, which is doing what is right. You'll understand what doing what is right. You'll know. You'll know what's wrong. You will have understand what is equity, straightness, that's what the word means, or smoothness, and every good path. The same path is kind of different. It explains the carts that they had during the writing of the book of Proverbs that had two wheels. And the oxen would pull it, and it would have, make a path, and as time went on, the path became harder and harder and harder, and that path became easier to tread on. It became easy, as the path is talking about. The more we apply God's word, the easier our lives become because we're following the path that God leads on. And this is what he's saying. Now, the wisdom that God speaks about, the things we've been talking about, will also do things such as protect you from evil men. In the next verse, verses 10 and 11, it says, when wisdom enters your heart and knowledge is pleasant to your soul, discretion will preserve you and understanding will keep you. So when the wisdom enters your heart, these words stress the internalization of wisdom. The proverb does not merely provide knowledge. They provide insight to be learned intimately and practiced, and discretion. Knowledge, when knowledge is pleasant to your soul and discretion will preserve you. So it says here, knowledge is pleasant to the soul. The word pleasant literally means beautiful or sweet or delight. So what God wants in your heart, he wants you to love the word of God. The Bible teaches that Jesus himself is the word of God. And God wants us to love his word. It'll be pleasant to your soul. And then he says, discretion will preserve you. That word discretion literally means careful about what one says or does in the Hebrew. It'll preserve me. Boy, do I need that. Verse 12, to deliver you from the way of evil, from the man who speaks perverse things, from those who leave the path of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness. So he says here that wisdom will deliver me from the way of evil. Wisdom will keep me from going the way that is evil or be influenced by those who are evil. The word evil in, in this context here means bad, hurtful, causing pain, unhappiness, and misery. Now, there are people 
that you would say are evil. This young man who killed four people in Idaho, that man did evil. He's evil. But when we look at other people who cause us or succumb to evil, we don't think they're evil. Let me give you an example. Before I was a Christian, I didn't understand evil. And I didn't understand people who brought me into evil. I was invited by my brother, who I don't know if I was close to or not, when you have eight brothers and five sisters besides the ones you have, I mean, besides, you, or you don't really know in the sense of how close you are, unless they're real close to your age. He's five or six years older than me. And he invited me, he was not a Christian, I wasn't a Christian, he invited me to smoke pot numerous times. Now this is my brother. And I kept on saying, no, I'm not doing that stuff, man. I don't want to mess with that stuff. That stuff is horrible. I don't want to mess with it. But how many young people today have been tempted by other people that you would think they're not evil in any way? They just made a mistake in inviting someone to smoke pot with them or come and get drunk with them. And be, the effects of that, of the sense of someone who does evil like that, can affect a person's life for the rest of their lives. It was one of your children that someone tempted them to do evil in the sense of smoke pot, take mushrooms, take some kind of drugs. I know without a doubt you'd probably say, that's evil, they're evil. And I would agree with you, that's evil. And possibly even they're evil. But sometimes I think we negate what evil is and how evil starts. Think about this. Every single one of you in this room, sometime or another, have been tempted with evil by somebody. But you would never think they're evil, what they're doing, somewhat. The Bible teaches that wisdom will deliver us from the ways of evil. But I have to know what God's word says and get the wisdom so I can know what's evil and what's not. There's so many things that I see as evil that most people don't even think of that. That's not evil. When I see the Black Lives Matters and they have their masks on and they don't want to show their faces and they go in and destroy and put police departments on fire and shoot and kill other people, be the people, and they wear their masks. That's evil. At least I think it is. The Bible says this wisdom that God wants to give you will deliver you from the ways of evil. From the man who speaks perverse things, that word literally means to deviate from what is considered right or wrong or acceptable, that which is wicked, misdirect, lead astray, corrupt. That's what wisdom will keep you from, a person who is perverse. If your child goes to college and they are taught the word of God and they'll get this wisdom, they won't be perverted in any way in the sense of lied to or brainwashed by the professors. But if they don't have God's wisdom, if you haven't taught them the wisdom of God and they grew up and off they go, they're in trouble. I'm telling you. 
and from those who leave the path of righteous, of the upright, I'm sorry, there are going to be people who once walked with God, who once thought that the Bible was the word of God. In fact, it's called, some of them are called prodigal sons or daughters. And the Bible teaches when they stray, the wisdom that God puts in you won't cause you to leave also. He goes on in verse 14. Who rejoices in doing evil and delights in perversity of the wicked. When I see certain things on the news, it bothers me bad because I see people rejoicing in the evil that they do. Let me give you an example. This week, the House, our House, Congress, voted on babies being killed after they are born. 220 Republicans voted no against it, that after the baby is born, they should be taken care of. 211 Dem Democrats voted not to take care of that baby, and they rejoiced in it. That's evil. Rejoicing in evil. Verse 15, whose ways are crooked and whose are devious in their path, and their ways are crooked or twisted. They are devious, as the Hebrew is to go wrong or go crooked, perverse. Verse 16 says, now it kind of changes subject, but it stays on the same subject. It stays on the sense of wisdom, but now it begins to talk about uh, women, okay? Not Christian women, but women in, out in the world. Verse 16 says, to deliver you from the immoral woman, from the seductress who flatters with her words, who forsakes the companion of her youth and forgets the covenant of her God, for her house leads down to death and her path to the dead. None who go to her return, nor do they regain the path of life. So we see the warning against the adulterous woman here. Wisdom will keep us from that. How the wisdom will lead you from her, deliver you from her, who flatters with her words. As most women know, <laughs> men are really suckers for flattery. <laughs> How most women know these things. They say such things as you're so strong and you're so smart and My wife and I, we've had conversations about women in the sense of, I don't know women. I'm not one, so I don't know. But I always thought that all women are wonderful, all women are perfect, all women, and I'm, not, I'm, I'm naive, I guess. And my wife set me straight and said, we're not like that, all of us. I said, oh, okay. It doesn't mean that they're bad. That's not what I'm saying. We all have a nature, an old nature that's not good. Okay, let's go on. From the seductress who flatters with the words. That word flatter in the Hebrew means to have a heart that is deceitful to bring forth deceitful words, to be smooth or slippery. She is false to him 
who she entices. She speaks fair, tells him how much she admires him above any man, and what a kindness she has for him. But she flatters with her words, her words. She has no true affection for him, nor any desire of his welfare, any more than delight I had for his Samson. And it's true. She is also false to her husband and violates the sacred obligation she lies under to him. He was the guide of her youth by marrying him. She chose him to be so and submitted herself to his guidance and with a promise to attend to him only and forsake all others. But she had forsaken him and therefore it cannot be thought of that she should be faithful to any one else. And whoever entertains her is a partaker with her in her falsehood. The scripture teaches here she forgets her covenant with God. Marriage, just a reminder, is a covenant that we make between a husband and a wife, a man and a woman, period. And then God is the witness, and we make it before God and to God and to each other. That's how it works. It's a covenant an agreement, a pledge. But this woman here, an adulterous woman, but it also speaks of a harlot, a strange woman, it says in the Old Testament. She forgets the covenant of her God and her marriage covenant. Listen to what it says here. Her house leads down to death. And it does. It destroys the relationship between a husband and a wife, and then it destroys the children. Think about this, beloved. This usually causes a divorce, and then the divorce, divorce causes destruction of the family. It brings death to the original family that God wanted to have them to have, a man, a woman, and the children for the rest of their lives, it does so much destruction. Listen to this part. Nor do they regain the path of life. Most people who get involved in this, it ruins it for the rest of their lives. It's done with, more to say, so to say, unless there is a true confession to God and there's a true repentance to God then there's a possibility of it being fixed if the party that has been sinned against is willing. Nor do they gain the path of life. The ruin of those who are guilty of it is certain and unavoidable if they do not repent. It is a sin that has a direct tendency to the killing of the soul, the extinguishing of all good affections, and the disposition, disposition in it, and the exposing of it to the wrath of the curse and the curse of the sword of God and his justice. Matthew Henry wrote this. Their repentance and recovery are extremely hazardous. None are next to none that go unto her return again. It is very rare that any who are caught in the snare of the devil receive, recover themselves. So much is the heart hardened and the mind blinded by the deceitfulness of this sin. Having once lost their hold of the path of life, they know not how to take hold of them again, but as perfectly besotted and bewitched with these base lusts. Now, sometimes we look at this and we think that's just for young men. And he is speaking to a young man. He's speaking to his son. But I want to tell you a story that I read a long time ago that has stuck with me my whole Christian walk. It was about an older man. He was in his 70s. And he was with a younger man who was in his 20s. They were both Christians. And they were walking down the street talking. 
And of course, they were talking about Jesus and how wonderful he was and what he was doing in their lives. And the older man was more or less a mentor. And they turned the corner and around the corner, they met a young girl with a mini skirt on, tight skirt, tight blouse, low cut, revealing. The young man starts rubbing his hands. The old man starts rubbing his hands. They walk by about a half a block down the road. The young man says to him, man, you're lucky. Man, are you lucky? He says, what do you mean? He says, at your age, you never have a problem with that anymore. You never, that never affects you in any way, does it? And the old man said to him, what do you think I am, dead? What is my point? My point is, your whole life, you have to deal with certain things. You can be tempted at 60, 70, 80. You can be tempted at 14, 15. You're not more so susceptible when you're older, but you're still susceptible. Now, we're almost done. Verse 20 says, so that you may walk in the way of goodness and keep the path of righteousness. And then listen to what it says, for the upright, those with integrity, will dwell in the land and the blameless will remain in it. So God has special blessings, a place that God has, and we could say the, in the Old Testament, he's talking about the land of Canaan, a special place that God has chosen for them. There's a special place that God has for you and for me. It's called the place of the Holy Spirit, the land of the Spirit. But also God has a place, a home that he has for you also. But the wicked will be cut off from the earth and the unfaithful will be uprooted from it. So he ends with this teaching, or the end of the chapter, with the facts. Whenever you read the scripture, God says the upright here will dwell in the land, and the blameless will remain in it. They're going to be protected. They're going to be saved. Their lives are going to be good. But God also says, but the wicked, these are facts, will be cut off from the earth, and the unfaithful will be uprooted from it. Recently, in the rains that have happened further north, up in the Redwood area, I don't know if you know it or you're aware of it, but many of the big Redwood trees have been fallen. Some of those Redwood trees are a thousand feet up. They go straight up, and you can see them there, just multitudes of Redwood trees. Many of them are falling and then knocking over others because they have a very small root system. Their roots go out, but they don't go deep. And so this is what happens to them. Now, if you see the oak tree, the oak tree has many different roots that go out, but they go deep. When the winds of life come, it doesn't blow them over. This is a good illustration for what Solomon is saying. Let's close our hearts. Father, there are many things that we've shared tonight, Lord God, about wisdom, Lord. How it protects us, how it keeps us safe, how we're to do certain things. But it's your desire for us to have wisdom, God. And we know, Lord, that you give wisdom overflowingly. You say in the book of James, it's your desire. But we also know, Lord God, there's our part to search out, to seek for silver or for gold, Lord. So I pray, Lord God, that we would put laziness aside, God, our 
Father, other desires, Lord God. That, Father, you'd put a desire in our heart to know your word greater than ever before. For they are truly treasures that keep us, Lord God. And Lord, I know that you want us to live in the land that you've chosen for us, Lord, that land of the Spirit, where there's many blessings, God. I know the life that you want us to have, Lord God. So I pray, God, again, for a desire, a hunger for the Word of God, to learn, God, and that we would have teachable hearts, every one of us, Lord God, that we would want to learn and want, want to grow, Lord God. Bless each heart tonight, God, for being here in that area, in that sense, God. And may you be glorified through our lives. In Jesus' precious name we pray, pray Father. Amen. Any question on